that you are joining us tonight for our online class. We are diving into our series, NUM, where we are talking about mental health. And so tonight, we are hoping to share some practical tips and applications for you that will hopefully be helpful to you on your mental health journey. So the way this is going to work is that we are going to cut to a teaching from one of our pastors, Kelsey, where she's going to share from the book of Philippians with us. And then we will be back later for a roundtable discussion that we can hopefully provide and equip you with some information that will help you along the way. There are resources posted, pinned to the top of this page. Should you need those resources tonight, if you find yourself in an emergent situation, please check that post. There's phone numbers for you to call or text or email addresses for you to reach out. Please don't hesitate to do that if you're in an emergent situation. We'll be taking questions at the end of the class, so be thinking about those and post those on the feed throughout so that we can answer some of those. If you have a more private matter that you'd like to discuss or something that feels like a little bit more heavy that you don't want to share with the rest of the people watching the class, please private message our page. We will stick around after our live feed is done so that we can connect you with our counselor here and be able to answer some of those questions for you. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and we'll see you back in a few minutes. If you've never joined us before, what's going to happen is you're going to hear a little bit from our hosts, you're going to hear a little bit from me each week, and then you're going to get to go back to our hosts who are going to kind of help us unpack some of the things I'm going to talk about. And my hope throughout this four weeks is to help us kind of begin some conversations about our mental health, about what we think about things, how we process the world, and how we deal with the messes in our life. And some of you are sitting here going, mental health, that's not me. That's a really big conversation, and I want to say... All of us have mental health. All of us have to process this. All of us have to deal with the fact that we have something going on in our lives that we have to think about. And so ease into it. Let yourself get into it as you feel comfortable and be prepared to really think together. Uh, it's gonna be some great conversation, so thank you so much for joining us. To start, my name is Kelsey, and I work here at Eastern Hills, and I'm super excited uh, to be joining you in this process, especially because we're gonna be going through the book of Philippians, which is an incredible story of this little church that was a podunk nothing that became an incredible story of God's faithfulness. So thank you so much for joining us. Now to start, I wanna talk a little bit about me. Why in the world do I care about this stuff? Well, for me, it was middle school. And I know middle school is this weird, wonky time for everyone. And there's this identity crisis stuff where you're trying to figure out who you are and where do I belong and where do I fit. But for me, it was that on top of the fact that I really began to experience incredible darkness in my life. And I couldn't really understand it. I had been bullied, so I kind of put it in that camp as, well, that must be part of what was going on. But the truth was... It was bigger than that. There were mornings I just couldn't get out of bed and I didn't know why. And that kind of continued through middle school and I got to high school and the benefit of high school is you can try different things. You can begin to find your community. And so I jumped onto the tennis team and had so much fun, was captained by my senior year, thrived. I joined my youth group and I became a volunteer in my youth program. And I was leading fourth graders, I was leading middle schoolers and I loved all of it. But ultimately, there was still something, and I couldn't put my finger on it. It was just heaviness. I remember weekends where I didn't leave my bed except to go to church or to do my homework because I still needed the straight A's and I needed to get it all right. And as I began to kind of walk into some of that, I stepped into a world with an eating disorder and really was wrecked. And I don't really fully know why or where that came from or how that fully came to be, but I needed to be perfect and I needed to be in control and I needed to have everything together. And so that was my way of owning me, but it didn't help. I got into college and kind of found some health for a while and struggled even just to find friends. And so that became kind of my priority. And then it came back and I'm not sure that it ever fully left, but this darkness, this heaviness just stayed with me. And I got to the point where I had begun to push all the people in my life out, uh, not because they were bad, but because they were good for me, because I didn't want them to change what was going on. For me, what I've begun to realize is a lot of us are sitting in messes because we can understand them. We can control them. We know them. I have a name for it. It's mine. 
And so I remember diving headfirst into this eating disordered world throughout college that it was all about what I needed. And I pushed everyone out, began to kind of fall apart, threw myself into work because, again, I had control. And ultimately, it wasn't working. It was destroying me. But I was pretty comfortable in my mess. And I wonder how many of us are too comfortable in our messes. I ended up going to therapy and not really because I thought I needed it because I wanted to keep my mess because it was mine. I could control it. It was mine. I could own it. But because people had said, if you're going to go into ministry, you should get therapy at some point. And so I wanted to be able to say to the students that I was going to mentor, hey, you should also get therapy. And so I went into therapy with the expectation of I'm doing this to check a box to kind of make it so that I can tell other people to go to get therapy and ended up there. And for the first several months, probably almost a year, I sat across from this therapist and I paid money to this therapist to sit. And sometimes I sat in silence and crossed my arms and just stared her down as if I was threatening her because I didn't want her in my mess because I was too comfortable in my mess to be uncomfortable enough to change. And so I continued to kind of keep her at bay. And then there would be other days where I would fight her and, and play this game with her on, on how much can I share so that she'll get off my back, but don't share the real stuff because I was too comfortable in my mess. And so we began this kind of dance for months and months and months. And there was one day in particular, I sat down in therapy, closed the door, and she sat across from me and she closed her notebook, which when a therapist closes your notebook, you wonder what in the world is about to happen. And she closed her notebook and she leaned in and my heart kind of stopped for a second. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, you have two choices. Either you can come back next week ready to work or I'm calling 911 and we're taking you to the hospital because that's where we're at. And it was in that moment that I began to really recognize my mess isn't that comfortable. My mess isn't actually working for me. For me, it became a mess that was between life and death. And for me, that was the moment that I realized it's not worth it sitting in it. It's not worth it being in the mess that God wants to get me out of because ultimately it leads to destruction. Now, I know for me, mine is very clear, very vivid, very like, yes, this was a life or death moment. Like I, I had to choose and, and ultimately I would choose to fight. But for some of us, we're going, that's not life or death for me, but maybe it's complacency. Maybe it's being stagnant. Maybe it's being too comfortable in a broken marriage that we're not willing to fight for it. Maybe it's too comfortable being broken in our relationships with our kids or with our parents or with people around us, we're too comfortable, just status quo, at least I understand it, at least I can control it. And you're thinking that's not life or death, but in your relationships, it is. In your health, it is. And I wanna be a people that we're not comfortable in our messes anymore because God wants more for us. One of my favorite stories is about this church in Philippi. It started by this guy named Paul and He's a pastor, missionary, church planter. He does a lot uh, to kind of bring Christianity or the message of Jesus throughout the, the Middle East. And he's doing a lot to build these communities. And so he enters into Philippi. And while he's there, he goes to start a church or to build a community. And so he starts kind of the way you expect to go to a group of people who are already religious, already have relationships with God. And he wants to build them to understand that Jesus has come to free, to open up the community of God. And while he begins this journey, he discovers that community doesn't exist. There isn't that go-to group. Right? If you're going to start a church, you're going to look for specific people to go start that church. You're going to find people who are biblical scholars. You're going to find the super charismatic one that draws people in. But he didn't find this already existing community. Instead, as he began to kind of work through this, this region, he ends up meeting a woman. And at that time, a woman isn't who you'd start a church with. Like That's pretty countercultural in this season of the world and so he meets this woman and this is his first interaction where someone is introduced to the hope of Jesus. And as he continues to kind of work throughout Philippi, person after person after person is the one you'd least expect. But it also became the church that was most successful. The church that for them, they knew their mess. They knew their reality because 
they didn't have these standards that they felt they needed to meet all the time because they were just being introduced to the freedom of Jesus. And so I call this church the Island of Misfit Toys because it's the church you didn't expect to make it. And yet as Paul leaves Philippi and gets word about what's happening in this region, he hears over and over and over about how their community is growing and how their community is so tight-knit and is taking care of one another and is building something beautiful together. And so as he begins to kind of continue journeying, he writes a letter to this church. And he doesn't reprimand them like he does in most of his letters. He simply encourages them. And you almost see this beautiful connection between him and this church that is just so profoundly beautiful because he's willing to sit in vulnerability with them. He's willing to be honest. And he led the charge in saying, we're not going to be a people that's comfortable in our messes. We're not going to settle for our stagnant lives. We're going to be a people that constantly is honest and open and transparent and live it out truthfully. So he actually leads, and as he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 1, he starts by just, I'm in, encouraged by you. I'm praying for you. I'm excited for you. And then he owns his own space. He owns his own journey because at this point, He's in chains. He's in prison, and it would have looked a little bit more like house arrest in this particular case. But he was bound, shackled, and yet he was writing a letter to a church to say, this isn't going to stop us. He says in chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That first line, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, I think when we sit in our mess, we miss out on opportunities for our mess to impact God's kingdom. When we sit and settle for, I'm fine, I've got this, everything's great. Don't ask me to confront my mess. We miss out on experiencing the community that grows together. So let's not settle. You see, Paul is in chains. Like he's in a position that is difficult and frustrating. And he doesn't sit there and pretend that it's okay. He says, listen, this is a horrible situation. But look at what God's been able to do. I think when we begin to open up, when we begin to become transparent about what's actually going on in our lives and stop pretending like everything's fine, we have an opportunity to see what God's been up to. Not to mention the people next to you that need your story or the people next to you that you need their story. You see, if we continue to hide and pretend and to put people apart from us, we miss out. And I think it's a condition, and it hasn't just existed now, but it's a condition we experience a lot in suburbia, right? I'm going to be in my house. Everything's going to look great from the outside. My kids look like they're fantastic. Everything looks comfortable. But what's actually happening inside? What's actually going on? Can we actually talk about it? because I think we've become too comfortable in hiding in the mess in our homes, hiding in the mess in our heads and in our hearts that we haven't actually made room for healing. We haven't actually made room for a community of people to come together and to live life even though they're messy because they have a chance to impact one another. So what are you settling for? And are you ready to stop? Are you ready to give up, well, this is just adequate enough, and to actually walk through the difficult stuff. I spent the next several years after that moment with my therapist fighting, and there were multiple weeks where she sat down and she's like, I think the next step is inpatient treatment, and I just remember these like moments that were f just difficult, and I didn't want them. It was so much easier for so much of that season to just pretend that it wasn't happening. And to help me, she gave me an exercise where every day when I would get in my car, I'd pull down 
the mirror in my car and I'd look in that mirror and all I could see was my eyes and I would just say out loud in my car, Kelsey, you have an eating disorder and you can't settle for it. And it was challenging. And there were days that just flipping down that mirror gave me incredible amounts of angst. But I don't want us to settle because settle leads to destruction. Whereas saying yes to what God has for us, even when we're in prison, leads to something incredibly profound. Let's be a community that doesn't feel comfortable in our mess, but owns it so that we can see what God can do with it. Hey everyone, welcome back. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. I just wanna say thank you to Kelsey for sharing her story with us and beginning to open up and be vulnerable with us about something that's really hard that she's faced in her life. And I think that just is really helpful for us as we sit here and we have this conversation together that um, we've, we've started off on a really good foot with some great vulnerability. So thank you so much to Kelsey for that. My name's Liz. I am the community pastor here at Eastern Hills. I've got two wonderful people here hosting this class with me. Hey, I'm Dustin. I'm the Connections Pastor here at Eastern Hills. And I'm Carrie, and I am a licensed professional counselor and happy to call Eastern Hills home for about 11 years now. One thing we just want to remind you guys of is that we will be taking questions from you towards the end of the class, so please feel free to post those. Again, if you have something more serious that you want to talk to us about after the class is over, you don't want to share it um, in the comments with um, all of the other comments that are there for people to see, please private message this online class at Eastern Hills page. We will stick around afterwards to answer those questions. Carrie will be available to chat with you as well. Um, and there's also a post pinned to the top of this page that has resources for you that are available. Kelsey also posted some in the comments. So if you are needing immediate help or to talk to someone immediately, please check that post. Be sure to call or text in or email into uh, one of those options that we provided with you. Yeah, and so today we really wanted to uh, get a chance to go over some more things that maybe will be helpful and applicable. And, uh, and so Carrie is going to actually talk to us about stages of change. So Carrie, can you tell us kind of what the stages of change are? And yeah. uh, we're going to talk about the first one more today. Absolutely. So really there's about four different stages of change. So if we start off, we think of the first one as pre-contemplation. And what that is is there's a problem. We don't want to deal with it. So... Um, we sort of know it's there, we might not, maybe people in our lives have pointed it out to us, but we're not quite ready to deal with it. The second, obviously, is contemplation, where we're kind of thinking about, yeah, maybe this would be a good time to start changing, maybe it's a good time to think about, is this really helpful to me or not? And then the next stage is action, so I'm actively trying to work through my problems, and then finally maintenance. So I've worked through it, and now I need to continue to do things to make sure that my life is maintaining this change. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah, so tell us more about that first stage then. If that's sure, so pre-contemplation. I think that's really a good place for us to kind of start tonight too. Um, you know, like Liz was saying, we really need to acknowledge that, you know, Kelsey was really vulnerable this weekend, Phil was really vulnerable, and we all have something. We all have what we call like our mess that we're sitting in. And the thing is, a lot of times that's the symptom. That's really not the deeper root. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's something going on deep within us, maybe um, a trauma, maybe a wound from our childhood, something that is just really difficult for us to deal with, but we're having these things that are coming out as a result of it. Um, addiction, um, eating disorders, gambling, pornography, drugs, alcohol. There's a lot of things that can be symptoms of this deeper problem. So when we're thinking about like pre-contemplation, we're in a spot of saying, I kind of know it's there, but I don't know if I want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So instead, I'm latching on to these other things. I'm latching on to these things that aren't helpful, but make me really comfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm online shopping a whole bunch, and that makes me feel a little bit better. You know, <laughs> I am um, binge eating, which for some reason brings comfort. Um, you know, and, and we're kind of in that place of not quite ready to change the root, but really dealing with the mess and the symptoms. Do you find that people um, in this pre-contemplation stage may even bring up another issue in place of the actual deep-rooted issue? Absolutely. Right. 
Can yeah. you hit on that a little bit more? Maybe? So really, like, if we're looking at Kelsey's story, which, again, so thankful for her, um, she's talking about an eating disorder. Her root problem was not an eating disorder. Mm. Um, she went to a therapist for an eating disorder. And a lot of times people will come and they'll start talking about, well, I have this anger. I have this um, addiction. I have this thing. And the more we talk about it, we're realizing you have that because this is how you're coping with the deeper problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people are coming to counseling because of the symptom and they're not really realizing the problem. So um, I kind of like to compare it to uh, like a broken arm. Mm -hmm. So let's say that years ago when I was a little kid, I broke my arm mm -hmm. and I never went to the doctor, never went to the hospital um, and I've just dealt with it. So it still kind of fixes itself a little bit, you know, like it mends, but it never really heals. Mm -hmm. So here's what happens. As I get older, I have no choice but to overcompensate with my other arm. Mm. That's my symptom. Mm. So I'm doing something mm. over here to try to take care of that. Mm -hmm. And this broken arm I'm really protective of. And if you get anywhere near it, I'm going to tell you to back off. Don't touch this. Don't get near it. And it's the same with if somebody says something that triggers my trauma. Mm. If somebody says something that takes mm. me back to um, an abuse in childhood something that is really the deeper a need for acceptance mm -hmm. uh, worth mm -hmm. then I'm going to really put up guards mm -hmm. and so we have that broken arm mm -hmm. as the root yeah. but we're overcompensating with the symptoms mm -hmm. and that's something that we see a lot in pre-contemplation and you know, we see people dealing with addiction and we're like man if they could get that under control and they can work on the symptom yeah. but they're not working on the issue and when that happens it just makes a cycle they take care of it for a little bit, they do really good, and then they slide right back in. Yeah. Goes really well for a little bit, and then they slide right back in until they get to the point where they say, I, I just give up. This is just who I am, and this is how I'm going to live. Mm. Wow. So what advice would you have for somebody who maybe doesn't know what their issue is? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a, good a really good one. Good question. Um, so what I recommend to people is if you're not really sure what your issue is, um, some people are listening to this and going, oh, I know exactly what my broken arm is. I could tell you right now. I might not want to, but I know what it is. Um, for people who don't know what that is, I really say start looking at your resources. Where are your resources going? Uh, the Bible tells us that our heart and our money are kind of connected in a way that we put our money where our heart is. So where is your money going would be my first question. Um, are you spending a lot of money on online shopping because that makes you feel better are you spending a lot of money on video games because I can completely zone out and do nothing and numb myself mm -hmm. in that moment mm -hmm. um, are you making it so that you're in debt because you're using your money in a liquid way so that people don't know where your money is going mm -hmm. are you mm -hmm. um, engaging in pornography are you engaging in gambling are there things like that mm -hmm. on top of that another resource is your time where's your yeah. time going yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of moms, I know I'm guilty of this, we were chatting about this, that um, I just get busy. I don't want to think about my broken arm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to think about my problem. And so mm -hmm. to not think about it, I just get busy, right? I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to be in all these activities. I'm going to run here and run there. And they can all be good things. Mm -hmm. I could be fully devoted to the church mm -hmm. and completely avoiding my real deeper issue. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you don't quite know what the broken arm is, Mm -hmm. Let's start with the symptoms. Yeah. And we got to do that by looking at where our resources are going. Where's your money? Where's your time going? Mm -hmm. And my guess is that's where you're going to find the beginning of the problem. Can you share a little bit more about people that may not be like excessively spending, um, but maybe numbing in other ways? Like we talked mm -hmm. about numbing on social media or mm -hmm. numbing on video games or those kinds of things. Like how can people who are kind of in that space where they're not necessarily spending money, like how can they identify that broken yeah. arm when like maybe their resources mm -hmm. aren't necessarily reflecting that yeah and I would say that's where we have to look at the time mm -hmm. that's where we have to see where's your time going if I am spending and again you know we want people on Facebook right now this is a good thing but yeah. if I'm spending you know six hours a day which sadly is not unheard of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on social media yeah. that is too much of my resource in my time yeah. that's too much of my time there mm -hmm. I am focusing way too much on that and, mm -hmm. and why because I don't want to be quiet I don't want to sit with what's really going on mm -hmm. um, it's like trying to ignore a toddler 
Mm. I know. I have a toddler. <laughs> doesn't work. Because the more I ignore him, the louder the mommies get. Mommy, 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 mommy. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like the more I'm trying to numb out, the louder that's going to try to come up. Mm -hmm. So I mm, never want to be quiet with it. Because if I'm quiet with it, I have to face it. Mm. So again, that's, that's kind of like an example of someone like it, that social media thing isn't necessarily a huge problem for someone mm -hmm. but it's pointing to the yes. underlying issue yes yeah mm -hmm. that is that is when we're looking at um the broken arm mm -hmm. what is the broken arm what are you avoiding what are you running from mm -hmm. and and i think a lot of people get this idea of if i dress it if i start talking about it i'm going to open the floodgates and it's going to be horrible all of these emotions are going to come out. I'm never going to be able to control it, so I've got to hold it in. Mm -hmm. And nobody's being helped by that. Mm -hmm. Nobody is. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we create this monster in our head, and we get comfortable. Mm -hmm. We're not really comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> we're complacent. Yeah. Yeah. But we think it's comfort, and we're mm -hmm. saying, well, I'm all right with my mess. But you're not. Mm -hmm. You're not. And mm -hmm. so we get quiet, and we have to face it, and it becomes really scary. Mm -hmm. And so just to build a little bit off of that analogy... The other thing that I really, really want people to know is that let's say that I did break my arm. Let's go back to that. And I did that years ago. At 38, I can still get that fixed. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem. I'm going to have to go to an orthopedic surgeon, and they're going to have to re-break the arm. Mm. There will be pain. Yeah. It will hurt all over again. But this time it's a productive hurt. Mm. This time it's a hurt saying that I know the end result. The mm -hmm. end result's going to be good. The end result is going to be healing. Mm -hmm. So what I really want people to know is that if you're walking around with your metaphorical broken arm, with this mm -hmm. trauma, with this pain, with this deep hurt, it's never too late. Mm -hmm. It is never too late to get that on the healing end. What can you say to address some of the fears that people may have in facing those big monsters that they've created mm -hmm. like what are some maybe steps towards bravery or things like that they can embrace or utilize in overcoming that fear of facing those big monsters that they've built up in their heads yeah absolutely mm -hmm. this yeah this this is what we need we need to feel safe we need to be reminded that we are not alone mm -hmm. if I can say anything tonight it's you're not alone mm -hmm. you're not alone People are engaged in this. The reason that this weekend was such a big response is that people are hurting, and we're starting to look around. I don't know which service everybody was at, but at the Saturday night service, we had these mirrors up, and we're waiting for people to go up, and it just took forever and ever, and then one person walked up, and then people just mm -hmm. started flooding. Yes. So I'd yeah. say one of the big things is to know that this is really a thing that feels isolating, mm -hmm. but when we start talking about it, we realize we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're having this class. Mm -hmm. We're doing this to let people know, number one, you're not alone. We have resources here in this church for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that is something that you're like, if I start talking about this and the floodgates open, what am I going to do? Well, that's probably a good indication that you should see a counselor, mm -hmm. that you should be with someone to walk alongside of you. Mm -hmm. You need a safe person. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's amazing that these monsters in our head, we start talking about them, and we see this little mouse in front of us, mm -hmm. and we go, it's nothing. Mm. I can deal with this. Yeah. But we allow it to grow in our mind. Mm -hmm. And when we start talking about it, it becomes much more manageable. What would you say um, for people in pre-contemplation? Um, I just totally lost my thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah. I, was gonna say I, I wonder, like for, for me personally, I went through uh, about a year, maybe a little bit more, of, mm -hmm. of counseling, consistently mm -hmm. seeing the same person. And going into that I was pretty nervous about it but I knew I just had some stuff going on that I didn't get like I mm -hmm. couldn't figure it out myself mm -hmm. and so I went into that and really was able to process through childhood wounds things that I did like you were saying like the broken arm I did unconsciously I performed I said I can mm -hmm. handle everything I know what I'm mm -hmm. doing like don't tell me I'm wrong like don't mm -hmm. tell me I'm incompetent and mm -hmm. even like this morning I I got an email from someone and they, I don't think they were being mean at all, but they were pointing out something that I had completely missed. They were just like super gracious about it, but I was like, all right, we're gonna get in a fight. Like, I've gotta defend myself. Like, I'm not incompetent. Yeah. And I had to just take a step back and go, mm -hmm. actually, somebody gave me some good advice to just take a step back and take a deep breath and go, you know what? 
I it's okay. I made a mistake. I missed something. I can move on. I think I don't know if that's is that kind of the process you're talking about. For me, that's yeah. kind of how I see that for myself. That is totally the process because um, you know talking about processing. So I love research. Mm -hmm. I don't love the number the numbers involved with research. So I'm very thankful that God gave that ability to somebody else, and I can read their research. <laughs> um, but talking about processing, that's really vital. Because if we have these things, we have this trauma, we have this hurt in our past, we have to process it. So mm -hmm. the research behind that, that I really like because it's just sort of a nice analogy, um, there were some psychologists that went to this really fancy restaurant, high-end restaurant, and they would mm -hmm. watch the wait staff go to the tables and take these orders, like 12 people. And of course, you know, high-end restaurant, hold this, put this on the side, I don't want this, can they do, they do this instead? And they can't write anything down. So they're listening and they're taking this all in. So they have these elaborate orders for people. On their way to the kitchen, the psychologist would stop them and say, can you tell me exactly what that order was? Word for word. They'd say it all. Perfect. They'd walk to the kitchen. They'd give the order. And then before they got to the next table, that same psychologist would say, can, can you tell me that one more time? Mm -hmm. They couldn't. They couldn't. It's fascinating. And the reason they couldn't is because they processed it. They did what they needed to do with it. Mm -hmm. They worked through it. They took the information they were given, mm -hmm. and they took it where they needed it to go, mm -hmm. and they could move on with their life. It is the same way. Mm -hmm. So we have these things in our lives. Mm -hmm. We'll catch ourselves in triggers. Yeah. Man, why is it that when they say that to me, that hurts so bad? Mm -hmm. Why is it that I get something that's really constructive, but it feels like a criticism, and it hurts me, and I become defensive? That's your broken arm. Mm -hmm. You're defending something. Mm -hmm. And so the reason we say that is because we have to be able to take these things and work through them. We have to be able to go to a counselor. We have to be able to go to a trusted friend. We have to go to a safe, spla safe place and talk it out, work through those feelings. And here's the best part of all. We're not giving that information to a kitchen. We're yeah. taking it to God. Mm. We're taking this and saying, here's my mess. Here's the deeper root. Here is all of it. I can't handle it, but I don't have to do it alone. Mm. And we can give it to him, and he takes it, and he says, okay, go ahead. Mm. You're good. Go. Move mm. on with your life. And that's the same thing with that little toddler who won't stop talking to us because we haven't processed it. The more we ignore him, the louder he gets. And I notice, even with my kids, if I say, you know what? I hear you. I know what you have to tell me is important, and I'm going to deal with you in a minute. Simply by acknowledging them, they start to quiet down. Same mm -hmm. with our anxieties, same mm -hmm. with our traumas, same with our hurts. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know you're there. I know you're there. I'm going to deal with you. Mm -hmm. And even just acknowledging starts quieting it down and gives us the ability to even begin the process of processing. Mm -hmm. So I remembered my question. <laughs> well, let, were you going to ask? Let me, see, let me pull up and see okay. uh, if anybody else has some questions or if you want to ask okay. one more. Yeah, I was going to say, what do you think is the biggest hindrance for people in pre-contemplation from like identifying what that broken arm is? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of times we just get so focused on the symptoms. We mm -hmm. get so focused on the mess. And then when we're in that, we tend to just think, if I just fix this, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we compare that to like a kettle on the stove, mm -hmm. um, we can lift up the top part of it, let the yeah. steam off, yes. and that's taking care of that. Yeah. Guess what? The water's still boiling. Yes. So that's something too. Mm -hmm. I think if we're dealing with the mess and we're working through, working through, and we keep going back, yeah. something's not right. Mm -hmm. This is a deeper issue. Yeah. So I think we get too focused on that and we won't allow ourselves to sit and get deeper. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that's when we're able to start really taking that kettle off of the burner, taking mm. the boiling part off and deal with it. Yeah. We can let steam off all day long, yeah. but it's not going to stop the boiling. Yeah, it's interesting. I had a, a conversation. I've been doing some coaching on my own um, for the last year. And we kind of compared some of the things that I've been dealing with to like an Instant Pot mm -hmm. pressure cooker. And really using the analogy, if you're familiar with the Instant Pot, you can quick release mm -hmm. your pressure, right? Yep. Or you can kind of naturally release your pressure. And if you're cooking something like a meat, you want to naturally release that pressure because then the meat is more tender. Mm -hmm. And if you quick release that pressure, the meat is not as tender. Yeah. And so I've kind of been using that in my life and thinking like in certain situations where I feel triggered or where I feel my anger kind of flaring up, okay, how is this pressure building up? And how can I be very much aware of naturally and like releasing pressure and kind of processing through mm -hmm. and 
and slowly just saying things here and there to kind of catch myself or stop yeah. myself and letting that out so that my heart can be more tender yes. in situations rather than hardening it by quickly releasing that pressure out. And I love so that. Yeah. I love that analogy. Mm -hmm. And that is so true because mm -hmm. when you hold that all in, yeah. there's pressure. Mm -hmm. It's got to come out one way yeah. or another. And we even talk about in some of my sessions about the more that we're just saying how we feel instead of, I'm fine, I'm yeah. fine, everything is great. When we can say, you know, for example, somebody says something and we take it the wrong way, when we can just say to somebody, so i got to tell you what I heard in that. Mm. I, I heard you criticizing me. I heard mm. this. Now, maybe that's not what you meant, but that's yes. what I heard. Mm -hmm. Just by saying that, pressure gets released. Yes. Instead of holding it in, what did that mean? What did, why would, did they say that? What, what am I doing wrong? Am I not of worth to this person? Mm -hmm. And letting that build. Mm -hmm. Just by starting to be honest, mm -hmm. just yeah. by saying it right out loud. Yeah. i got to stop you right there. This is what I heard. Mm -hmm. For better or worse, this is what I heard. Yeah. It gives that person a chance to explain themselves also, and it gives me a chance to talk about my feelings in the moment instead of sitting with them. Yeah. And just running with them all night. Yeah. And letting that monster. Yes. Get Let it control. build. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any questions? On we, so we didn't really have any questions um, for now. Hey, if you are watching and you are interested in something we said or you have a question personally or, or in general and you want to leave a question, uh, we are going to actually answer some questions at the beginning of next week as well. So yes. if there's something that comes up later that you want to ask about, um, we'll, we'll all be here next week uh, to talk about those as well. But Carrie, before we kind of wrap up, I just had one more question. What would you kind of like one solid piece of advice for somebody who's going, hey, I maybe don't even know mm -hmm. what the broken arm is. If mm -hmm. you had like just one thing to give somebody who's watching today that wants to figure that out for themselves. Absolutely. So I would say that, like, I, like we were talking about before, there's a lot of people that are watching right now that can say, oh, I know. I know exactly what my issue is. I can pinpoint it. I might not want to say it out loud, but I know what it is. Um, so for those of you who are saying, I don't really know, but I know I have some stuff. I would say, let's back off from the broken arm right now. Let's kind of focus more on the symptom. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the mess and let's see what we can do there first. So I think the first step is identify the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So what I would encourage everyone this week, something that you can do that is really a safe thing to do, that's not too overwhelming and a really great place to start is just, let's kind of think about where your resources are going. Mm -hmm. What do you do when it's quiet? Do you get busy? Do you start acting and doing things and performing? Uh, do you turn on the radio so you don't have to be quiet? Um, are you finding that when you're sad that you're turning to food or to alcohol or pornography? Or where is your time going? Where's your money going? Um, I could say, you know, just to give a personal example, when I was even thinking about this, I'm like, oh, where does my stuff go? And I'm like, oh, I don't think I really have anything. And I'm like, oh, I eat a lot of fast food. And for me, it's a coping skill. It mm. is a, it has been a stressful day and I am just at my max. And you know what? I deserve a cheeseburger, right? Mm -hmm. And as silly as that sounds, that's something that could get out of control. Yeah, mm -hmm. That can definitely get out of control because I'm drawing comfort from that thing that lasts for a minute. Yeah. And then it's gone, right? Yeah. Or I could say, what am I doing with my time? Well, if I feel criticized, you know what I can do? I can sure make my house look clean, you know? I can sure do activities with my kids. I can be busy, busy, busy and perform. And so just in thinking of those things, I'm like, wow, I can identify two things right off the bat where um, left unchecked mm. can really turn into a problem. So that would be my encouragement for everyone this week. You know, really kind of sit down and think to yourself, where are my resources going? Um, if that's something you need to do privately, that's perfectly fine. If it's something that you can do with a trusted person who you really feel safe with, even better, even better. Talk it out because the thing is they have stuff too. So they're not going to say, wow, that must be terrible. You know, <laughs> if it's a safe person, they're going to say, oh, I got yeah. some of that too. So that would be the starting point, in my opinion. You know, talking about pre-contemplation, maybe you know what your stuff is, maybe you don't. But we all have it and we can all start searching. Cool. What is a piece, really quick, um, just of some wisdom of how God can kind of step into those places too that we can leave people with tonight as they're working through identifying what those symptoms are? What is yeah. an encouragement that you can give to people? 
Well, you know, I love our theme. I love Jesus makes life better. Mm. I love that because we can say, you know, I'm all right with my mess. Mm -hmm. It's comfortable. It's fine. It's been this way. Um, But the thing is, we wouldn't have New Year's resolutions Mm. if we were really truly comfortable with our mess. Mm. Uh, We wouldn't have all these gym memberships. We wouldn't have um, addiction hotlines. We wouldn't have all this stuff. So um, I think we need to first acknowledge that our mess is a complacency thing. It's not a comfort thing. Mm. And comfort is not always better. Mm. Jesus makes life better. Mm. He's going to walk with us in this. Mm. And the greatest thing in all of this is that we're not doing it alone. Yeah. None of us are doing it alone. Jesus is coming alongside of us, and he's saying, okay, you know what? You're not ready to do this. That's fine. I'll take it. Mm. I'll take it for you. Let mm. me walk in this with you. Mm-hmm. You know, Let me provide people in your life that can walk in this with you. That's been the greatest blessing for me is that when I've gone through things, it seems like the Lord always provides somebody that I feel safe with, that can talk with me, that can speak scripture into my life, that can speak truth into my life, Mm -hmm. and to always be able to find the ways to hold on to that truth. Mm -hmm. So I would say that God is Mm ever-present. And the thing is, you know what? If you don't ever want to change your mess, you don't have to. That's the reality of it. Is that the best choice? Absolutely not. But here's the great news in that. Jesus loves you no matter what. Mm -hmm. He loves you right there. So you don't have to do anything or become anything to meet his approval, you know, to be good enough to be a Christian. He loves you right where you're at. Mm. He's just whispering to you, oh, but it could be so much better. Mm. It could be so much better. Mm. So good. Thank you. Hey, before we wrap up, we actually did have one question come up. Um, Can you give some examples of healthy natural release methods I, I don't try totally understand the question but you yeah. probably do so <laughs> yeah so I think anytime we have a coping skill um, the thing is if I say coping skill everybody automatically thinks oh it's a healthy coping skill well getting drunk is a coping skill not a great one <laughs> but it's a coping skill you know so I always say look at your intent mm. what's the intent mm. behind this Um, A really good question to ask is, am I distracting from a problem that I just cannot deal with right now that I can put down for a minute and move on with my day because I got stuff to do. You know, I'm a mom, I have a job, I've got stuff to do so I have to set this down. That's okay. Distraction for a short while is okay. Or am I avoiding? I just don't Mm want to deal with this. I could deal with this, but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. So really, if you can tell what your intention is behind it, am I just distracting from this? Mm -hmm. Um, Am I doing this thing, this activity? Am I taking a walk because this gives me a moment of calm and helps me to calm down so I'm in a place I can deal with this? That's a good, healthy thing to do. Mm -hmm. I would say always finding a way to speak your mind, to really talk about your feelings. That's a really good way and a healthy way to release. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, you know, spending time. If you have a good quiet time, if you have a good app, if you could find a good YouTube channel where you're getting some Bible study stuff, something that takes your focus off of the negative and puts it back on the truth, that puts it back in a a positive, um, helpful light, Mm. that's a great thing. Um, I have a lot of teenagers, and they'll say to me, well, I listen to music. What are you listening to? Because if you're listening to stuff that's feeding off of the negative emotion, that's Mm -hmm. not good. You know, I've got a, a couple of clients who really love to turn on praise and worship, and that totally takes them out of that bad space and yeah. helps them work through it. Yeah. So look at your intention behind it. Mm-hmm. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this just so I avoid it? Am I doing this to get through this moment? Am I doing this to get myself in a better space? And if your intention is good, then that is a good coping skill for you to mm-hmm. use. That's very helpful. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Carrie. Yes. Um, we are going to be back here next week. Um, and like Liz said earlier, if you uh, are watching and you have a significant need right now or something urgent that you'd like to, to talk to us about, or maybe just a question that you didn't feel comfortable asking uh, in front of everybody, uh, you can send us a private message and we'll stick around for a couple minutes and uh, answer any of those that we can. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for being here and uh, have a great week. <laughs>